It's kind of exciting. I have my little, you'll see it in a minute, humidifier going. And uh, because it's so hot on this porch, it's kind of helping out my plants quite a bit. So I decided to add it to my routine and make it a part of my devotional time and emotional and sharing. You know, one of the things someone asked me recently was like, why being a network engineer and having worked as a journeyman boilermaker and then also having been disabled and having gone through all these variety of experiences and having all these different skills and technical abilities as well as ability to differentiate between information systems and doing all kinds of, you know, goofy stuff that's either tech-oriented or physically oriented. Why do ministry? Why, as a Jesus freak, would you want to go into and share with and be a part of, you know, an individual ministry that isn't financially prosperous? Why not go into the ministry and be a pastor? Why not go get a following and be supported by donations. Why not go out and get money to support that which you're doing? And you know, I smile at that because people don't understand why sometimes you do things. I mean, am I narcissistic that I need to be on camera? Which, you know, after 35 years of being, you know, involved in different portions of my life at times in ministry, that working behind the scenes you know, I enjoyed that so much that now being in front of the scenes, people think, well, that guy must have a huge ego. And it's like, you know, well, if I did, what happened 20 years ago? You know, why wasn't I in front of cameras then? I knew how. The point is, every day that you walk with Jesus, he brings you into a new awareness and understanding of himself as well as people around you. And part of what I do is that I feel challenged by watching people misled or deceived or somehow stuck off into a corner regulated to some function that they don't enjoy and know Jesus in a personal way that it frustrates me, it aggravates me, it makes me want to you know, run out and shake them and say, wake up, look, here, let me get the earplugs out of your ears. You can hear Jesus. You can talk to him. You can let God lead you where he wants you to be, not where you think or someone has told you you should be. Why not find out if the God that you said is alive really is? Why not investigate and find out factually that you can know Jesus? And that's what drives me. That's what, oh, umps me, you know, with an unction that cannot be quenched, that I want more so for the person like you, even me, to know more and to experience more of God. Not just experientially, but in the Word. In God speaking to you, not just in devotions, meaning that you have some devotional book like Daily Life, which we read from, or that you have the Bible that you read from, that you study daily to hear His voice, to know what God is like, to know the Father in an intimate and personal way, to know Jesus in such a way that you can say, hey, when I don't know, I go trust in the Lord with all my heart. I don't lean to my own understanding. In all my ways, I acknowledge Him, and He directs my path, and I go and follow Him because I hear His voice, and His voice speaks to me, and I know what He's saying. That's the point, because the world is coming to an end. I mean, it's not long, but it's not too short, you know, but any day you could die, so, frankly, if you don't know the day or the hour, don't be surprised. Nobody knows the day or the hour they're going to die, so that's pretty simple. But we are in the last generation. There is no doubt about that. Israel became a nation, so we're in the last generation. So the point is, you're going to find out very clearly who Jesus is, one way or another. And he would prefer that you know him in a more personal, intimate way that reveals to you how loving not only he is, but his father was. His father has always been. And that's how we've misunderstood the love of God. And that we need to be revealed to us what love the Father has for us by Jesus demonstrating that to us in salvation. In daily life, rejoice in hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. In this life only we have hope in Jesus. We are all of men most miserable. We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. No man should be moved by these afflictions, 
for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Blessed power of the Holy Ghost. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to its abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, whom having not seen, you love, in whom, though you see him not, you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, by whom you also have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You see, the glory of God isn't something like some mystical, magical, Holy Spirit kind of revival meeting thing that comes down upon you and you go low and you go and you become all... But rather, the glory of God is to reveal in you the salvation His Son has paid for in the revelation of that which God has done through His sacrifice, meaning the atonement. We call it the Akidah, the, the binding of Isaac in the Old Testament. In Jewish culture, that was the ultimate sacrifice that Isaac was willing to be sacrificed. Because you see, Abraham, being as old as he was, there was no way that he could tie up Isaac and sacrifice him. Isaac had to be willing. And so, the same thing we see in the willingness of the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus, the Messiah, that He was willing to do the Father's will, even to the point of dying, where Isaac was willing to be sacrificed. But we find in the completeness of what Jesus has done, that love the Father has for us, that He was willing to even turn His back on His own Son and allow Him to perish and to die for you. Of course, he rose again, but are you willing to die for your enemies? I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. O oh, precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in numbers than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. O oh, Lord, how great are thy works! And thy thoughts are very deep. Many, O oh, Lord, my God, are thy wondrous works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom? having nothing yet possessing all things, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you know, that's what motivates me, is that I was spoiled rotten. I didn't look for God. I wasn't planning on getting saved one day. Suddenly, I didn't just go, hey, you know what, I'm a drug addict and I'm going to get saved, you know, or I'm high on whatever, it may have been pot or, you know, or heroin or acid trip or whatever back in the 60s, and suddenly I went to a Jesus concert and got saved. No, I was just kind of an innocent little kid, you know, that was looking for love, you know, and found these people that were like all joyful and, wow, I got saved too, because when God saved me, I had this miraculous experience, you know, that was overwhelming and that it was fully emotional, but at the same time, I was given so much that I was spoiled rotten, that I was brought up in the way of the Lord, and that I learned scriptures from the very beginning, and that I was very confident and composed within God to know Him solely and then to take everything to Him personally and to always have a revelation from Him in order to operate in the scriptures that He would show me what He wanted me to know and that He would reveal the entire volume of the book to be about Jesus from cover to cover. And so with that, it's like, oh, if you only knew is what I look at people when they are misled or deceived or don't have the fullness of the knowledge of God that they can have, that they could experience daily like we're doing right now. Jesus is here in the midst of us. He's in my heart. He's in your heart. He's right here, standing here. If he wants to reveal himself, he'll go, bingo. And he doesn't have to snap his fingers to do it. But he'll show himself. And he can do that at any moment because he's already done it since the resurrection. He does it in the Jesus moment. He does it daily to people. You can hear his voice audibly as well as read it physically. So don't limit yourself ever by what someone told you or what you think you know. Go farther with God. 
move on with Jesus. Let his Holy Spirit lead you and guide you into all the fullness of God. Because grace is extended to you to know him in a personal, intimate way now, so that when the day comes soon, and we become enraptured and taken away from this world, then we're not shocked by what we see. If anything, we're blessed.